Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Financial Innovation, now gone virtual. Normally, we look at innovations on a company by company basis. We look at fintech uh, innovations and we've been looking at them for some years. However, this is a slightly new venture. This is where we don't look so much at a com com company, we look at a country. Estonia with its e-Estonia program, with its e-residency program, has been in the forefront of digital innovation. And the COVID-19 panic means that I think that this will become even more relevant in the future. Uh, I'm delighted that we have two leading figures in the Estonian e-commerce, e-finance, e-residency area to talk. Uh, first of all is Tavi Rivas, Roivas. Uh, the Prime Minister for the Prime Minister of Estonia from 2014 to 2016, and still an MP and Vice Chairman of the Reform Party faction in the Parliament. Uh, he's a specialist in blockchain and artificial intelligence and in cyber, and he's a pioneer pioneer of the cross-border service digital services initiative that was represented best, I suppose, by Estonia's e-residency program. Uh, he's the star, he was the star of the Daily Show in the United States, for those who uh, go back to uh, Trevor Noah. Um, he's uh, something of a figure internationally. And backing him up is Kasper Cordius, uh, the first managing director of the e-residency program in, uh, in Estonia and the co-founder of a new AI-based business negotiations tool known as Pactum. Uh, he, Pactum allows companies, and I quote, to autonomously offer personalized cons commercial negotiations on a massive scale. I don't really know what that means, but I'm sure we'll find out. Uh, my colleague Leighton Hughes and I will butt in only as and when required. Uh, this, the intention is to get a dialogue going between Tavi and Gaspar um, and to learn more about what e-Estonia has to offer. I should add that Estonia is not new to, to innovation in this area. For those of you who go back, back to the bad old Cold War days, you may remember the Minox camera, which was uh, favored by spies on both sides of the divide. That was devised in Estonia. And of course, Skype is an Estonian product. I give you the former Prime Minister, Tavi Roivas. Tavi. Well Thank you very much for the very, very kind introduction and, and greetings from Estonian countryside. Uh, I that sounds a bit a like the Eurovision Song Contest. Let's get away from that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, uh, I think it's very symbolic that I'm currently uh, way out of office. Uh, the closest uh, city is um, uh, just tens of kilometers away and there is a sea between uh, between me and, and the next uh, next uh, point where, where anyone lives. So, so basically, that's just to symbolize that uh, uh, as for Estonians, it's relatively comfortable to, to quarantine uh, because uh, we are very much used to using uh, digital solutions in, in our everyday life. For example, later today, I will uh, have to go to notary and, and I will do it uh, from right here. I, I'm just logging in uh, using uh, Estonian solution uh, by a company called Verif. And I, I'm good to go uh, just to verify my, my real estate transactions. But uh, just to go back uh, very, very briefly, why Estonia is very digital, I think the best explanation or most logical explanation is that uh, Estonia was occupied by Soviet Union for five decades. And when we got our independence back in the early 90s, that was the time when we needed to build the country, uh, rebuild the country from scratch. And of course, we made sense, or it made sense to use the latest technology. And as you remember, in the 90s, internet was becoming a thing, more and more popular, more and more used. And, and uh, that is w one of the main reasons why Estonians uh, started using uh, lots of uh, um, internet-based uh, services and, and solutions. And of course, the backbone of it all is our digital identity and, and digital signature that goes along with it. So basically, if an Estonian signs anything, uh, it doesn't happen on paper or scribbling with your pen, which I would argue is hugely unsafe. 
you know, none of you, uh, except for Kaspar, perhaps. Uh, but I'm not even sure about Kaspar. If, if he has seen my handwritten signature, perhaps he has seen some, you know, same guest books or, or something like that. But but probably even he da- doesn't know what my handwritten signature looks like. And, and I, I don't know any of your handwritten signatures. So how can I ever be certain that this was actually uh, signed by you if it's a conventional way? Whereas Estonians call signing... Um, basically a digital stamp on any file, which is, uh, we use uh, two-way authentication for that. We use uh, either our phones um, and, and PIN codes, uh, or we use our uh, ID card plus PIN code. It's it's really, really logical. It makes much more sense. And, and with that, of course, we can do anything uh, from, uh, from logging into government registries uh, to checking our um, health. For example, if an Estonian goes to uh, COVID uh, testing, uh, the, the way you get to know whether your test was positive or negative is logging in the patient's portal. And, and uh, it's, it's really very easy. And you also see who else has looked at your health data. Uh, legally, it's only your doctor who's allowed uh, to see that. And if, for example, you, you get the test uh, of, uh, of, of any disease that, uh, that you don't want to make public for uh, or even your doctors, uh, then you can close it because you as, as the citizen are, are in charge. So yeah, these are just a few examples and, and uh, we are very much used to uh, working uh, in a way remotely. There is no papers passing from government to parliament. There are no papers uh, passing from myself to, to government uh, if I'm in the role of, of the citizen. Everything is uh, done digitally, and, and this is possible because of digital ID and digital uh, signature. And one last a bit funny thing, uh, our um, uh, colleagues in, uh, in Poland uh, had to postpone uh, and presidential elections because of the COVID pandemic. That would be unheard of in Estonia because uh, uh, anyways, uh, almost half of Estonians uh, voted uh, over internet. So, so it would be very easy for us to organize internet voting uh, instead of uh, ordinary one. Uh, like, and, and I'm sure that uh, all people would have uh, good access, even if you, know, you are in the remote countryside as I'm right now. Okay, let me bring Gorsius in here, Kaspar Kaspar Gorsius. Kaspar, all of this depends to a very large extent on trust in government, does it not? I mean, I can well imagine that one of the problems that the polls have is that only only 40% of the population trusts the government that they have. In Estonia, there must be a level of trust that doesn't exist in many other European countries. Kaspar? It's a very valid point, and I guess... We are so small, you know, look at Tavi, you know, can't you like just trust him, you know, it's like person like we are, it's not like some high figure up there who no one sees and just take photos of when they see him on the street, you can call him, you know, if you want to, uh, he picks up the phone and he speaks to you, he's, as, and, and we have been colleagues, schoolmates, and it's a small community, both in government and in private sector, and that makes it more feeling that, of course, we trust each other, we, we are like, the intentions obviously are good. How we reach there, of course, there are disagreements, but we know that uh, we want uh, we want to progress the same way. And we are hungry. We are hungry for progress. We are hungry for huge growth, not just like 2% GDP growth. We want to ex- hundreds of percent of GDP growth. Like we want, and, and when we are hungry and when we trust each other, then innovations can take place. Some of them fail, some of them succeed. Talk a little bit about how you set up the e-residency program and w- what that is. You were the managing director of it, I think, from, uh, uh, I'm not quite sure when, from 2014 to 2019. Yes, sure. So e-residency is the same IT card which Tavi mentioned, but now everyone can apply for it, so you can become our digital citizen. Uh, so Estonia became a port nation, everyone can become part of this. And, and uh, we set it in a way like startups do. We didn't have any idea why you should become an e-resident or why we should do e-residency. We set up a landing page, you managed to subscribe to become an e-resident, and then we had a huge PR event together with Tavi when we went to the US and uh, we handled first e-residency cars there. And, and then it, we started to find out why we should do it, why you become e-resident. And this, we started to change legislation, update the processes, add services. And now after five years, 
it's a huge success story because together with e-residents, we have learned what to do. We have learned ourselves what value we can offer to e-residents. And only through this failure and success, uh, success can happen. And it's unique to Estonia to kind of try out new things, to go there and change the law without knowing exactly what are the outcomes after five years. But we know that technology is there for future. We know this world is changing that way, and we are ready to make this first leap towards that. So what, what are the benefits of East resident, uh, e-residency? What would convince somebody like Leighton or, or even myself to become an e-resident of Estonia? Well, there are many reasons. For one is that uh, you can be part of the EU business environment, which unfortunately soon you can't be. So if you want to have transactions in euros, uh, you have a, uh, you need some licenses, let's say in fintech in, in euros, you can passport them if you have EU business entity can do all the EU transactions through the EU uh, uh, business. And if you want EU business, you don't need to fly to, I don't know, Brussels or fly to Helsinki and have a company and people working there. You have by EU residency. Within five minutes, you establish company, you establish banking account, you set up the business and you're up and go. And basically you can remotely manage and that administer that digitally signing contracts, filing tax and everything. And it takes just a matter of minutes. Uh, so that's one one benefit why people join well, Eurostat. Let me let me counter that by saying that in the financial services sector, the European Union has made it very clear that you must have a physical presence in order to trade across borders. And Britain, British companies will not be allowed to access to the single to access to the single market just on the strength of uh, you know a uh, a brass plaque in Luxembourg or something like that. Can we can we get round that through Estonia? Yes, three residents, you have physical ads in Estonia, and uh, and this is legit, uh, because this is the new world, you know. Even if I'm Estonian, I'm quite often traveling around the world, I'm not living in Estonia, it doesn't mean that I can't have an entity there. People are remote, people live and work from anywhere, and the residents enables to do that, enables this remote life to live there where we actually want to live, but have our business run up and running. So how many people have actually taken advantage of the residency program so far? And where do they come from? They, the growth, at least until uh, last year when I was still running it, was exponential. So every year it's doubling the number of e-residents, number of companies. Uh, it's over 70,000 e-residents already. There are over tens of thousands of companies that have established already. This means that basically... Uh, the growth rate of e-residents is bigger than the birth rate of Estonia already. <laughs> but basically, digital Estonia is growing more rapid and exponentially than physically we are because, you know, one woman can carry one child or sometimes many, but it takes some time to give a birth. But e-residents as startups, they can grow and exponentially. And then there are no limits of a nation or how, how big one nation can be. And I see that Estonia is a nation of billion billion uh, citizens, digital citizens globally in, in, in some time. And this, this will change everything for a nation state. Okay, let me go back to Tavi. Tavi, you, you, you talked a little bit about uh, the, the, the break with the Soviet Union as being the, the Kickstarter for this, uh, for this innovation. But even in the bad old days of the Soviet Union, there was a sense within the Baltic states that you were somehow different, that you had a much more Western European orientation, and you had a very strong technical background uh, in the educational system and, and such like. Why, wh how, d how did that happen, and where is it going? I mean, uh, you know, I've heard you described as Finns on steroids. <laughs> Well, that's, I, I haven't heard that one before, but of course, uh, having Finland as a close neighbor helps a lot because uh, before uh, Estonia was occupied, we were uh, at par with Finland in terms of economic development. Uh, and, and you're correct to say that uh, we are different uh, from, um, from um, Soviet Union or, or like the, the occupation of Estonia was very violent and, and very unnatural. And, and Estonians have been and... and uh, still definitely are part of uh, of uh, core europe so so for us it's it's uh, very logical to to be part of um, uh, the european community um, now uh, education uh, has been uh, key in estonia uh, we have taken it seriously 
also during the Soviet occupation, and, and luckily it was possible to do that. A lot of uh, technical education. And if you look at the PISA tests, uh, you see that Estonia is ranking uh, top of the world. Uh, last uh, time um, the, the results came out, there were only a couple of, uh, of Asian countries uh, in front of us, but Estonia was clearly the number one from, uh, from Europe. And of course, we are very, very proud of that. And we we need to continue taking our education very seriously. Of course, now during the COVID pandemic, uh, uh, also Estonian educational system is uh, is under huge pressure of uh, innovating. Uh, I, I have to say, I'm a I'm a father of uh, of three kids, out of which uh, the oldest goes to fourth grade, and, and I'm I'm seeing she's she was just just before we started uh, having her uh, English lesson uh, across uh, across uh, Zoom as well. Uh, and uh, I think that Estonia was uh, quite well ready, actually, for this kind of uh, distance learning. And, and I'm very happy to see how four graders uh, uh, like develop in, in terms of using different uh, platforms to, to study. So I'm, I'm sure that uh, this pandemic actually gives us additional push for... Uh, for using technology, and then that same applies for uh, um, e-residency. I hope because uh, we have been struggling uh, together with Kaspar and many others, uh, struggling to explain in the world that uh, handwritten signature is not safe. It takes a long time uh, for me to sign a document and get it to you in UK, for example, and and all the process is slow and, and unsafe. And now we also have this. Uh, uh, virus element. Uh, we need to have some sort of contactless uh, uh, approaches, and voila, digital identity is perfectly contactless. And then I can sign from here. You, with your e-residency card, uh, can sign from your home or, or office, and we can do the transactions uh, basically in real time. It doesn't take uh, more than I don't know ten seconds to sign a document with that. So th that's where we should be aiming, hopefully. And, and I hope that now it's easier for Estonia to to convince the rest of the world that uh, we all need digital identities and, and we need to design it properly so it is much safer and uh, much easier to use than, than your uh, paper passport or your handwritten signature. And how? what kind of response are you getting from Brussels on this? I mean, you're running up against um, certain countries within Europe that have, as shall we say, a rather more backward view of technology that are still uh, in the land of paper and pencil in some cases. What kind of response do you get from Brussels? Well, uh, the process is not the problem, actually, in this case, because uh, in all of EU countries, uh, legal framework is there. The standards are there. Basically, they are good to go if they want to. And, and we were lucky to have the former uh, or recent um, uh, uh, commissioner for digital agenda from Estonia, my predecessor also in the role of, of being prime minister, Andrew Sainzip, and, and he pushed that digital agenda forward quite a bit. Uh, but uh, we feel that the main uh, obstacle is mainly political from uh, different countries. And, and what they say, you know, Kaspar can, uh, can confirm or, or add, add um, additional arguments. But basically what they say is that, uh, you know, you are a small country, you could do it, but we are much bigger. So there is like one, two, three million reasons why this is impossible. Mainly the arguments against having a proper digital identity and, and digital government are um, more political than technological. Uh, keep in mind that Estonia introduced digital ID uh, almost 20 years ago, so it can't be a rocket science for any European country, for any country in the world, for that matter. We still had, uh, you know, lots of uh, people using dial-up connections uh, back in uh, the days when we when we introduced digital identity. So, so it can't be technological obstacle. It, it has I, to be only I political. Just, and I just have a question yeah, about. Maybe a bit more contrarian, but uh, you know this um, this crisis will accelerate digitization, and um, you know as uh, out of necessity. Um, and I was wondering if you know um, is it possible that Estonia could lose sort of a competitive edge? You know because you know it, everybody Estonia, else is forced to catch up with you. Is that yeah, it? you know Estonia is a digital leader, and you know could other countries then sort of replicate your X road, or is that 
Is that unique? <laughs> it's 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 brilliant question, and uh, and I think uh, this is what we hope for. It's not a competition. Like Estonia is helping endless amount of countries to uh, take the first step of digitalizations, then the second step of becoming portalless, and then the third step of becoming AI-driven nation. So it's and 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 the more nations join this, more powerful it is, and uh, we can start sharing applications, infrastructure, uh, data exchange, and everything. And Estonia be power more powerful also through that. So that's why Estonia is helping everyone. And now the last week's news was that uh, the uh, World Health Organization is going to uh, use Estonian uh, data exchange tax road uh, themselves, and through that, hopefully, it reaches for nations. Uh, so it's definitely a good thing. Just to explain what the X road is. Uh, X road is Estonian term how we exchange data between public and private sector. So basically, if I want to renew my driver license, I allow the system to access my passport picture my health records, and then it gathers everything up and second click, I sign it and I have a renewed my uh, driver license. And for that, I didn't have to visit three or four different physical offices. I just allowed the system to access the data which was there already. And the extra term which states how this data exchange is happening. This is the once only principle That's that you do not, you only go once into the system and, and everywhere, everywhere the, else, semi-automatic. That's true, because if already I have this passport picture in one database in population registry, then the driver license database doesn't need to keep that data. They can just ask that data and verify that this is it and they can use it. And that's why once only that uh, no repetition in IT system is relevant. Can I ask both of you, um, you obviously, I mean, the Baltic states are the obvious place to export your technology to. Uh, you cooperate on so many other things. You've just recently announced a sort of COVID, um, what's the word? You, you've ended lockdown um, for travel within that particular common area. What are you doing in the technology area? Are you, are you um, as it were, in bed with your neighbours on this? Not particularly. Uh, with, with startups, with, with, with startups there is... There is no neighbors. There is, the world is your neighbor in that sense. That uh, startups still go to the biggest, large markets, and and uh, and our headquarters is still in California, not in Estonia or or, or nearby nearby countries. And uh, and in that sense, the neighbors are are, are less important. Uh, but of course, when it comes to best practices of digital innovation in government, then of course, neighboring countries share more of those best practices. Politically, how does it work, Tavi? Well, uh, I think the best example uh, is our cooperation with uh, Finland uh, in developing uh, cross-border digital services. Uh, that's probably the first uh, and, and still uh, only or, or one of the very, very few uh, things that has been developed uh, in such close cooperation in, in the e-government space. And for example, if an Estonian goes to uh, Finland and, and lives there, and, and needs a, a digital prescription. Uh, for, uh, you can just call your doctor in Estonia. Uh, she puts the prescription in the system, and you can go to any pharmacy in Finland and get the uh, medicament from there. Uh, and, and it uh, works vice versa, because there are tens of thousands of uh, Estonians living in Finland and, and uh, tens of thousands of uh, Finns living in, uh, in Estonia. So imagine if, if that would work also for all the Brits living in uh, Costa del Sol or, or in, in any, any area of the world. And, and we are coming to this point that you were asking whether Estonians are sad if, if other countries uh, will pick up the digital uh, uh, transformation. I would uh, uh, be on the same page with Kaspar that, that it's, it's actually what we are wishing for. If uh, we, we know how easy it is uh, to... Uh, to business, to interact with your government, to get public services, private services, using digital ID. And our dream is that if it works uh, across Europe and, and ideally at some point globally, that will bring uh, the world much closer. And, and as Kaspar made the point, uh, uh, lose the physical borders even more in, in many aspects. And I think that uh, actually COVID-19, you know, with, with many negative uh, consequences, of course, but COVID-19 has brought the world uh, in some aspects closer as well. It's now perfectly uh, 
okay to to have conferences uh, across Radio Bridge and everybody can uh, contribute uh, from their own area. And, and for, a, for a country that is um, a bit uh, more physically distant from the Central uh, and, and the Western Europe, uh, for, for us, I think it gives a huge potential and, and uh, loads of possibilities. And, what about and, not only for, and not only for public sector, right? Today I had calls with Australia's retailer and uh, later I have calls with the US retailers. So basically, I'm pretty sure before COVID-19, I should have had those important uh, board uh, physical meetings, which I can now do so that kids are on background and it's still normal. So it definitely boosts uh, some feeds, at least in, in economy also. I don't know. Here in this country, I think we remain split. Half of us think that uh, we can do most of our business online and through video conferences such as this. And the other half wishes profoundly to get back to a physical office and profoundly to meetings where you can actually see the whites of somebody's eyes across the table and share a cup of coffee with them. I don't know. In, uh, in Estonia, that, that split doesn't exist. You're all firmly on board in, in a virtual no. world. No, I, I would say that definitely physical meetings are relevant in some context. The default thinking in our head at least shouldn't be that if you want to do business or anything, then let's meet and let's discuss. Like, let's meet and discuss at one point, but 90% of the times let's do it digitally. What about the, the reasons that there has been a certain amount of reluctance to, to follow Estonia, particularly, I think, in Southern Europe? I mean, you've talked about people saying, we're a bigger country, we, you can do it because you're so tiny, we're a bigger country, it's much more complicated here. You don't see that, Tavi, you don't see a problem of scaling up at all. You consider that this is, uh, as it were, moral weakness on the part of the Italians, for instance. No, I, I wouldn't uh, say a moral weakness. I, I think it's mainly because people are concerned on uh, privacy, uh, on uh, data security, and these are all very legit concerns. Uh, when Estonia started with e-government, we tackled uh, these or addressed these uh, issues very, very carefully. And, and uh, I, I have to reiterate that uh, uh, the, the only way to have digital government is to take care of the security questions first and, and take care of the privacy questions first. Uh, just like you talked about uh, this once only principle, uh, there are lots of legal barriers, uh, what information can be exchanged and how. For example, uh, uh, my, uh, the tax authority uh, and uh, my doctor can both access uh, with, with special system, it, it actually happens in the background, they can both uh, know where I live because th they have the right to know. But the tax authority can know in nothing about my health and, and my doctor can know nothing about my income. So it's the system has to be designed uh, properly and, and this is what we are arguing to to the other, uh, let's say, governments and, and, uh, and political leaders that, uh, that this is the, the best way to actually do that. Uh, also, when we have the question of privacy, there is a very unfortunate case of, um, well, there are actually several in, in UK as well, where the patient's data has been somehow published or, or stolen. There have, have been uh, people calling to the hospital. There have been uh, uh, people looking at uh, paper files. The case of Michael Schumacher uh, in uh, the Swiss hospital, somebody went to look for his uh, uh, medical file that was on paper and it is much uh, more difficult to to get these people caught whereas in Estonia in theory any doctor can access my my medical data but if anything is published or if even if I myself uh, have a hunch that somebody has looked at my health data I can just go to the log and see exactly what page was looked at what time and and nobody is stupid enough to commit a crime that the uh, you know, there is a hundred percent accuracy of, of getting caught. So, once more, if the system is designed properly, it can be used anywhere. Scaling digital is uh, easier to scale than anything else. Uh, that's one of the reasons why Estonia has so many startups, so so many successful digital companies. Uh, just today, we had um, news that uh, Bolt, uh, operating also in in uh, London. Uh, raised another uh, 100 million, uh, I think, euros or dollars or like 100 million, uh, lots of lots of money and, and being valued now 1.7 billion. And 
and there are several others that uh, Estonian companies that have, let's say, in five or, or eight years uh, become unicorns. So this wouldn't be possible uh, in building, uh, let's say, from scratch a steel mill. That, that doesn't happen so fast and, without and, uh, ex- and, excessive and, capital. And connecting that to the previous question of, uh, uh, of the Nordics and Finland, and basically we need examples. And we have had Nordics as an example in government, the same way we have had Skype as an example in private sector. We have like over 50% of new startups have worked in Skype or have been the founders of Skype. Uh, and, and my investors, first four investors, all of them have some attachments in Skype, whether founder or general manager. And this really, this eventually makes it so huge effect that eventually kind of uh, we need those examples to take risks to, for, to innovate. And, and we have been lucky that we have been nor- near Nordics and we have had examples of Skype in private sector. Okay, I want to go back to, to this issue of privacy and trust, though, because clearly, I mean, are you saying that there have been no cases in Estonia of hacking into the system, of exploiting the system, of in, there's been no there have been no questions of fraud involved with the system. Are you that confident that the system works a hundred percent of the time? There, Tavi, if I'm correct, and uh, there was one police officer who checked his uh, ex uh, uh, wife uh, data and was caught, and of course, uh, uh, basically, he lost his uh, police license after that. So there have been like one or two cases uh, which have been publicly at least known where people have misused the system. Uh, but the I, question, if they, I, I, I would rather ask, I, I, I would rather ask back, where is your data? Where is your health data? Who looks at your health data today? Who changes the plot type of yours today? You don't have any visibility, any idea of anything. So we need to start comparing the things, not saying whether something can be fooled or misused. And when you compare to the the base way of acting, uh, like I in Estonia, you you couldn't do a contract on paper based. Like people don't trust you. They think that you're going to change the contract. You're going to eliminate that, or it's not your signature. Whatever the reasons, when you compare the digital way how you built a not 25 years ago, you you can't compare the digital technology with 25 years ago, how it is built today. Then there is a question that you cannot trust the paper-based way of how we operate. Tavi. Yes. Well, well, we we have been discussing in Estonia a lot whether at some point of time quantum computing can break uh, this digital signature or not. We have been discussing that for a long time and and so far no signature uh, has has ever been uh, successfully broken. So so that's, and, and no system has been successfully hacked as well. Uh, but I have heard uh, that uh, when I was at school, uh, let's say a 10 year old, some of my classmates, of course, I never did it, but some of my classmates uh, falsified their parents' signatures in order to get out of trouble. And the teachers believe that this handwritten scribble was actually you know, made by their parents. So um, how's that for safe? That's the handwritten me, signature. Let me put the alternative to you. Yeah, we in the UK have a completely dysfunctional health service. I, I'm sorry, uh, a completely dysfunctional tax system. Uh, but one of the advantages that you have is that there is no centralized database. And nobody controls all my data. It's distributed all over the system. And if somebody hacks into one bit of it, they aren't hacking into the whole. You say, obviously, that your security is so wonderful, you're, and there is so far no significant history of people successfully back hacking in. But if they do hack in, everything is there. Everything. No, 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 no. The opposite. Estonia is the centralized way of how it's built the system. So we don't have any centralized way how we keep the data. So even if you hack the system, and let's say that you have super... Uh, uh, computer which can uh, uh, decrypt the encryption, which you can't, but let's say that you can, and then you can access only uh, that one system, and uh, uh, and it's, as it's decentralized, you don't have access to anything else. If you compare the Estonian system to any uh, physical way of, of storing data, I would argue that ours is much, much safer. Uh, it is much easier to break into any hospital cellar where the patient's data is kept than to hack into uh, 
properly managed uh, digital uh, system. And of course, uh, uh, we need to uh, continue upgrading our security all the time. And one of the reasons uh, to, to keep our data safe, uh, we have also established uh, uh, the system of, of data embassies. So basically, the most critical Estonian data is stored at the same time in, in several physical locations, even several physical countries. I had a particular question about the data embassy because it sounds like quite a novel idea. Um, do you think that this could be replicated? And I mean, is, is there a backup of the backup? And is there physical security outside of the, of the embassy? I mean, how does that work? Well, I think uh, all the countries in the world have their uh, most critical information systems uh, backed up uh, somehow and then hopefully also clustered to different locations. Mm -hmm. uh, what Estonia did it was taking it to the next level, meaning that uh, we have our uh, data or most important uh, uh, registers um, working uh, if needed from uh, different countries. So currently there are two, uh, but I mean, one in Estonia and, and the other one in, in Luxembourg, but there will be uh, several more hopefully soon. And the idea is that whatever happens to the physical server environment in Estonia or Luxembourg, you can just pop up the system from any, any other location. And mm -hmm. why this embassy, that's also very important. Uh, this particular part of the server room where it is held has to be under Estonian legislation. So Luxembourg government uh, uh, has a special agreement with Estonia and, and gave these square, square meters uh, in this server room uh, to Estonian legislation. Mm. Is this something that you can uh, actually sell to others? I mean, can you be, as it were, a cloud-based server of your own, a cloud-based company of your own, offering these services to other countries? It's, uh, it's Estonia. It's not the safest place, maybe, to, <laughs> to keep the data, but <laughs> but uh, we can come in. No, I, I, I would disagree with that. I think Estonia, <laughs> as, as part of NATO, is extremely safe, but... Uh, but uh, no, you uh, could have. I'm just thinking aloud. You could have an independent Scotland. You could pitch this to an independent Scotland. Effectively, run Scotland for the Scots. It would be a great deal for both of you. Uh, well, yeah, we, we don't uh, intervene in in uh, the politics of any any other uh, country. But but uh, what what uh, what can be done? I, I, well, we we especially avoided uh, putting our data to let's say any major. Uh, a service providers cloud uh, and that was mainly because we want to make sure that Estonian legislation applies no matter what and that's why we needed the state embassies in principle UK US any other country can can do the same uh, very easily just uh, you know in the location of your let's say American embassy you just uh, create the server room there with very good connections and uh, you just put the most important registers uh, uh, running there, you, you make sure that they are in uh, in real time and, and easy as that. Uh, countries, bigger countries actually uh, have uh, much easier ways to do that because you already have big embassies in, in most of the countries in the world. So we, we, we don't have big embassies in most countries, so we just uh, have to make up those uh, special data embassies. Can I ask Kasper, let's just look briefly at where Estonia stands now going forward. Uh, the ecosystem for innovation for uh for financial innovation in particularly uh, in particular is how healthy is it and how uh are you you are involved with with pactum which is a particular uh initiative but there are, are, are many others where do you get funding um is the ecosystem in estonia as healthy as it, it should be it's it was beautiful to start doing startup like i started that one year ago it took a few weeks to get the first funding of 1 million. And now after a few weeks, we'll have another announcement. And uh, and all this ecosystem of startups and entrepreneurs are really supporting each other. Every every media journalist who comes, we, we share that. Every big company who comes, we share that. And and we support each other. And that, that makes it very, very kind of good base to start. And... Uh, and uh, when we see the financials, then for the past 15 years, when we had, uh, 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 when we kept the data, every year on average, the number of taxes paid by startups in Estonia increases 30 to 40 percentage. 
the number of employees higher increases 30 to 40 percentage. And, and we are used to figure that, and it's already 7% of Estonian GDP. But when you consider now other sectors increasing one to two percentage and one industry increases 30 to 40 percentage, and it continues to do so, then we can see that it's inevitable that after 15 to 20 years, Estonia economy is based on technological advancements, both in public and in private sector. And this is what, what uh, will make Estonia, how Estonia is defined in, in future. Tony, can I ask, to, just to summarize the government's position on this, what kind of support does it give to the sector? Well, I'm not representing the current government. Uh, our party is currently in the opposition, but in principle, of course, the government is uh, is continuing from uh, from one political party to other, and and, uh, and the biggest uh, positive push uh, a government can give to startups is uh, not to be on their way and and uh, constantly improve the legislation. Uh, I can just give a couple of examples from the time that I was still uh, in office. Uh, we made it easier for startups to hire talent, uh, to get uh, talent also from third countries, um, uh, issuing a special uh, startup visa, and also uh, having no restrictions on, uh, on uh, well, we have some sort of migration quota from uh, third countries, so, so we lifted that from ICT and, and, and startups. And secondly, startups said that our legislation on uh, stock options is not as favorable as some of the best examples in the world. And they came up with a better solution uh, so that we can be very competitive and, and we changed that law as well. Uh, I remember it took us uh, four months from the idea from the startup community to passing the law. I was so proud of it. Uh, we thought that this was super fast and, and we really like did well. And the startup guys told me that, can you be any slower? Four months is you know, forever. So so that's the, that's the Estonian uh, uh, attitude of it. This is a bipartisan uh, commitment to technology, is it not? I mean, this is not something it, is a question it, of a government and an opposition. It's, it's so and so. The current government definitely uh, uh, can't say that it's so supportive, so it still depends on times. Uh, uh, for example, now with COVID-19, there were topics whether kind of startups can also get some support from government. And uh, basically, you know, the old school companies only are real and legit and proper companies and eligible. So these kind of discussions were quite uh, hurtful. And so it shows that it's not uh, apolitical. Oh. Does, does Prime Minister, um, does Prime Minister uh, Kalyurait have a specific um, fintech package then? Or is that just not on the table at all? You know, it's particularly for the COVID disruption, disruptive times economically. Uh, the current government uh, is is not uh, opposing all the all the progress that's being made, but the point is that they also I agree with Kaspar that they should be pushing more for uh, for all the opportunities and 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 uh, there are a couple of uh, good initiatives uh, by the by the private sector uh, private sector uh, and the community organized hackathon that uh, became basically global and a very Estonian thing again let's let's come together let's create something you know how to manage uh, personal equipment uh, this protective equipment how to how to do this how to do that how to do contact uh, tracking uh, all, all of this uh, some of good uh, applications have come out of that but I think that uh, there is room uh, for the government to be even more supportive and, and I think now uh, we are facing the time when all the governments uh, should look how we can be really uh, taking our country to the next level in terms of digitalization and then providing services. Okay, well, that's, that brings me to the final point. What is the next level? Let me ask, first of all, let me ask you, Kasper, what is the next level as far as Estonians uh, uh, move into the electronic future is concerned? What would you like to see looking... Uh, beyond COVID, say, 18 months in the future? So, in short, there are three steps for governments in the next 100 years, what they see. First is to become digital, as we discussed today. Second is to become borderless, as uh, the example of e-residency. And third step is to become AI-driven, so that uh, political decisions won't be based on Davis' gut feelings, but based on data 
and analytics mm-hmm. and uh, and and based on that Tavi can uh, inform and make decisions and and this ai driven kind of uh, 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 governments and applications like we see in the private sector is something uh, what what is definitely needed and will be there like basically similar with the private sector basically now i'll take my 15 seconds to pitch private sector in in pactum we are automating negotiations in a way that uh, corporates need to do the strategy and once you think the strategy then back to enhance and makes those uh, negotiations happen let's say with walmart we are negotiating hundreds, tens of thousands hopefully of uh, of contracts so that humans don't need to do the work uh, of actually making things happen now the same with government if tavi and the decision making shows that taxes will be changed in next two months like that healthcare I don't know, we need vaccines in that space because the DNA data shows us something like that, then basically this can trigger the next events, what happens in government. Today, it's not happening like that. Today, we even don't have long-term analysis, long-term visions, uh, and it's more based on short-term political kind of games. Xavi, are you as uh, optimistic about AI and as you, are you as concerned about creeping short-termism within uh, the political environment in Estonia, as uh, as Casper is? Well, I, I tried to uh, stay on the opposite, uh, this optimist side. I, I think Casper's uh, company, Pactum, is a good example of uh, how we can use uh, AI to do something more effectively and use less uh, manual force in doing that. And I think the governments uh, should move in the similar uh, direction so that the services we can give to the citizens are uh, more uh, comprehensive. We can uh, still keep helping them also like in in, uh, lots of uh, more uh, contact ways, but but the, the, the... background work uh, can be automized uh, quite a bit and, and using data to take uh, uh, more informed decisions. I think if we would have that already, the world would have uh, been able to be much uh, more successful in, in uh, tackling uh, COVID as well. So hopefully for the next waves, we are much more uh, prepared. And also uh, where AI will definitely uh, uh, change our lives is is lots of technologies becoming uh, autonomous, be it driving, be it, uh, be it uh, factories. Uh, there is still a lot of room for technology to, to take over. And I don't think politicians should uh, try to regulate this away. I think we should enable progress uh, and uh, we should uh, see where the next jobs uh, can be created instead of protecting the ones that uh, are inevitably um, going away or, or like disappearing. We cannot keep the jobs of, of yesterday uh, alive forever. Great. On that optimistic note about uh, the technologically driven future, can I thank uh, you, Tavi? Can I thank you, Kasper, and my colleague, Leighton, and all of you for watching. Many, many thanks. Thank you. Thank you.